Oh, it's this thing. Ahora se supone que ya se nos está viendo y demás. Vale. En principio tendría que ser así. Vale. Lucía, ¿me confirma si se ve? Vale. 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 Eh, well, okay. Eh, hi everyone. My name is uh, Jose Ignacio Segovia Martín. And today I will be here talking about my research that is called uh, double weighting for covariate shift uh, adaptation in the prognosis of COVID-19 infections. So, uh, well, I think we can start, right? Okay, uh, where is the... Where is the ah, okay, one moment because I need my... Where is the... No, she's still. Ah, okay, yeah. Okay, so so let's let's start. Well, as uh, we all know, uh, COVID-19, COVID-19 was a disease that affects the entire world in the year uh, 2019, and here in this map uh, we see a representation of the of the spread of the infection divided by regions, so that. The, dark, uh, the darker the red is in the region, it means the, the more spread. We can also see here a graph uh, representing the spread of the disease of COVID-19, but this time uh, through the different waves uh, in, the, in the different continents. As we might see from these uh, two plots, we might realize that the data uh, around the world, how the how the disease affect the world uh, was different in each of the regions or in each of the ways. In the meaning that, for example, uh, the affect how the how the disease affects two countries as that Spain, the behavior will be totally different from other countries like China or also uh, the data be, uh, that come from the wave number one will be different than the data from the last waves. So trying to predict uh, one wave or one data using data collected from different regions, uh, different waves, might require carrying out an adaptation to these uh, health data chains. So, well, now uh, we are in the framework of uh, supervised learning. As some of you might know, supervised learning is a common technique in, in machine learning. In which, in which we try to learn a classification rule using uh, data collected in the, in the following way. Here uh, we have some training samples and training samples that in the case of COVID, they will be COVID patients. With these training samples, we will try to learn a classification rule that it's just a map uh, from X to the set of the distribution over the labels that in this case it will be the needed of a briefing machine. And once we have learned the classification rule, we want to assign new labels to the new instances at testing, so that if a new patient comes, we want to uh, know if we should give him or her a briefing machine. So a, a common assumption in the supervised learning framework is that the data at training and the data, data at testing follow the same distribution. As we saw in the previous slide uh, with the COVID, it might happen that this doesn't occur. So, this is where the word covariate shift appears. In covariate shift, we have uh, these, these two assumptions. The first one is that the training uh, instances distribution and the testing instances distribution uh, differ is different, while the conditional probabilities remains the same. This means that, for example, if we have data collected, uh, like if we are going to train with data collected from Spain, and we want to train in, uh, let's say, data collected in China, we have that, for example, uh, some uh, health uh, variable would be different, like, for example, uh, the cholesterol levels or other uh, healthy parameters would be totally different in one country or the other. 
And the second, the second equality, the conditional one, means that I don't care if, uh, if it's a training sample or a test sample, I will classify it in the same, in the same way. Okay, there are multiple approaches that uh, try to deal with, with the covariate shift problem. And now I will, I will describe the, the two main approaches. The first one is called a reweighted approach. This approach is based on weighting. In this case, the f will be a loss function. So it's based on weighting loss functions at training using this weight function beta that is defined as a quotient uh, between uh, marginal probabilities. And we have, uh, we need this condition to be satisfied in order uh, to, to be well defined the, the, the weight function. This way, we are assigning low relevance to the training samples that are unlikely at testing. Okay, so, well, in, in this figure that, that we have here, we have that the red and the blue circles represent Gaussian distributions with probability mass concentrated inside uh, the circles. And the dots represent samples and the, the size of the dot represents the weight associated, the beta weight associated to those samples. So that for the samples that are inside uh, the blue circle that have higher probability at testing, they will be assigned a higher relevance and for the training samples that are outside of the blue circle, they will have a lower probability at testing, so they will have a lower, lower weight. Okay, so basically, in regarding again to the case of COVID, this will mean a situation in which we have data collected from all the world and we just want to predict in, let's say, Spain. So, we will assign more relevance to the data training related to uh, Spain, to the patients from Spain or patients for, from countries that are similar in the sense of the data to, to Spain and we will assign lower relevance to countries that are totally, uh, to have totally different uh, data. So, well, uh, which are the, the main problems of, of this approach? The first, uh, the first problem is that we need this support condition because if we don't have uh, the support condition this is not even well defined. This support condition just means that the probability of testing is inside the probability of training. And the second problem is that even uh, when this support condition is satisfied, it might happen that some weights might become disproportionately large, uh, completely uh, dominating the learning process, which means that at the end, for example, in this, in this second figure, it would mean that at the end we are basically learning using just two samples. So, well, so these, these are basically the, the two main problems of this approach. The second approach I will introduce is the robust approach. And uh, the robust approach is based on weighting a uh, future function, weighting functions at a uh, testing using uh, this weight function alpha defined as this other uh, probability co coefficient. So, uh, well, coefficient of probabilities. So remember that the reweighted approach weights uh, loss functions at training. This one weights at testing. And again, we need this support condition. In this case, the support condition means that the probability at training should be inside the probability at testing. So, this way, we assign low uh, confidence. We as uh, to okay. This way, we assign low confidence to the training in, uh, to the testing instances that are unlikely at tra at testing. So that we are considering classification rules that assign low confidence to the uh, to those uh, testing instances. Uh, so again, we have uh, these, two, these two circles. This time, the red one, that is the training one, is inside the, the blue one, that is the testing, to uh, have this condition. And we can see as the 
the test instances that are inside the, the red uh, circle, that is the, the training distribution, have higher values assigned to them as the probability at training is higher than the probability at testing. And the ones that are outside have lower values. So, again, to go back to the case of the COVID, this would mean uh, a situation in which we have a data force of Spain for training and what we want to predict in the whole world. So, our, our classification rule will assign high confidence to the prediction uh, regarding to the data testing that it's uh, from Spain or from countries that are uh, similar to Spain in the sense of, of data of health and we will assign low confidence to prediction on other different regions that at the end we don't we we cannot uh, learn at, at them so because if we just have data from Spain we cannot learn like very very different uh, countries and, and so so basically this is what what this uh, rose approach uh, do Again, what are the two main uh, problems of this, of this approach? The first problem is again that we need this, this support condition to be satisfied because if not, the weight alpha is not well defined. And the second problem is again that in some situations, even when this, when this condition is satisfied, it might happen that some uh, values alpha might become disproportionately large so uh, leading to classification rules that are overconfident and are just confident in a very small subregion of x so in this in this case in this second uh, picture it would mean that we are we just we will classify uh, with high confidence just these very few few samples and we, and we will basically random classify the rest of the samples. Okay, so now I will explain our proposed approach to deal with covariate shift. First, well, first, uh, here we can see both approaches together, and here we might see as one being the inverse of the other, because as I said, the weighted approach weight at, tra at training, the robust approach weight at testing, and uh, the quotient one is the inverse of the other. These, these two approaches might be seen as, okay, uh, in general in supervised learning we have that the two distributions are the same, so both are, uh, if this is training, this is test, both are like this. So when we are in a covariate shift situation, they are separated, and if this is training, this is test, Reweighted approach would uh, do like this, like putting the training distribution close to the test distribution, and the robust approach would, would do the other way in our, the other way around, putting the test distribution close to the training distribution. So why not like do something in the middle? So this is our proposed approach. Our proposed approach it's called double weighting approach because basically we weight both training and testing uh, samples uh, in, this, in this way. We have that this first equation regarding expectations uh, is satisfied for every pair of functions alpha and beta satisfying this uh, second equality. So this way we can avoid uh, existing approaches uh, problems because first of all here we don't need any support assumption so we can avoid this, this point. And the second thing is that we can avoid having large values beta by reducing the corresponding value alpha as they are related. And we can also avoid having large values alpha by reducing the, the corresponding value beta. And well, uh, here we have that, for example, this is a, a possible solution of the, of the second equation that, that we can see in this in this slide and here the it's it's just a general a general function so well uh, here we have the th the three approaches together and uh, well you yeah, see from here that if we fix in our double weighting approach alpha equal one then the beta is the beta defined for the weighted approach and if we fix beta equal one then the alpha is the alpha defined as the of the robust approach 
So we can see reweighted and robust approaches as a specific solution of our proposed approach. So, well, just to sum up uh, this first part, uh, we have that the problems of the existing methods is that, well, first of all, uh, for the reweighted approach, we need the support condition, and even when the support uh, condition is satisfied, if some uh, values beta get a, a really large uh, value, disproportionately large value, this will end up uh, leading to inaccurate estimators of expected losses. And for the case of robust approach, uh, even when we have this support condition satisfied, uh, it might happen that if some uh, values of alpha get disproportionately large value, we will end up having overconfident classification rules or classification rules that are just confidence in a very small subregion of X. So, the pro uh, we have our proposed approach called double weighted, and the main contributions of our work here is that we propose a learning framework for this uh, general covalent shift adaptation. With general covalent shift, we mean a covalent shift in, in which we don't need to have any assumption regarding the, the, the supports. We don't need to know how distributions are. And it's based on weighting at the same time both training samples and testing samples, as, as I mentioned before. And we also develop effective techniques to compute these uh, weights in practice and these techniques generalize the conventional Kelvin mean machine that just obtained weights at training. And this Kelvin mean machine is a, it's a very conventional uh, method in the covariate shift uh, setup. So, well, now I will proceed to describe the minimax risk classifiers because now that we have our approach we need to introduce this approach on a learning framework and we will introduce it into the minimax risk classifiers learning framework so uh, first i will explain explain how are uh, minimax risk classifiers and then we will see how can we adapt these minimax risk classifiers to the covariate shift setup and then i will explain how to compute in practice these, these alpha and beta weights. So, well, uh, the goal of the minimax risk classifiers is to find classification rules that minimize the expected classification uh, loss, that it's uh, well, this expression that we have here, and uh, the first one, and the minimax risk classifiers, they minimize the worst case expected loss with respect to distributions inside, uh, inside uncertainty sets that I will define later are the ones that we have we can see here defined as U and these uncertainty sets contains the true underlying distribution that it will be the testing distribution with high probability and we have this R of U that is what we call a minimax risk so we say that a classification rule is an LMRC if it's a solution of this minimax uh, problem, the mean uh, max of the of the loss. This is the minimax problem. So now I will uh, describe how are the uncertainty sets. For this, we need to define a future mapping that is just a mapping uh, defined here where, uh, well, we have this Kronecker product, this circle with the x is a Kronecker product, and this E sub y is the y element in, a, in the canonical basis of r power, uh, the number of elements of y, just to remember that x is the set of instances and y is the, the set, represent the set of, of labels. So, the uncertainty set u it's defined in terms of constraints of the expectation of, a, of this future mapping phi that we have defined. And here we have that the, the tau represents the mean, the mean vector, the, that it's just an estimate of the expectation of the future mapping. We estimate it using uh, these training samples. And lambda represents the confidence vector with which the true underlying distribution belongs uh, to this uh, uncertainty set U. 
Well, now that I have uh, explained a bit uh, how the minimax risk classifiers are defined, I will continue describing how can we adapt this framework to our uh, covariance uh, approach. So, well, uh, again we have, this is as we had in the previous slide, we have the future mapping and we are going to define a new future mapping that is a weighted future mapping that defined as phi sub alpha, where alpha, remember, it's the weights associated to the test samples and it's just uh, alpha times the original future mapping and this time the uncertainty set u will be defined in terms of constraints of, expect, uh, of expectations of this new future mapping phi sub alpha. Remember that in the normal MRCs we have the original phi, ma uh, phi future mapping and this time we are using the phi sub alpha future mapping. And uh, we have that we can estimate this expectation of phi sub alpha by defining this other uh, new future mapping, phi sub beta, as the weighted uh, future mapping by the weights at training. And we have that, uh, well, we can estimate this using a sample average of uh, uh, training samples, and we have that this estimation is an unbiased esti estimation of this expectation if we have that uh, beta and alpha satisfy the double weighting uh, approach condition that I will I don't know if it will be visible or not but anyways I will write it uh, here I will write it big so everyone can maybe can see it but if beta and alpha satisfy this condition here we have that this estimation is unbiased it's an unbiased estimation of the expectation. I don't know if it's visible, but this is the condition. And again, we have uh, the confidence uh, vector lambda. So, well, uh, now that uh, we have uh, redefined this new uncertainty set U for the uh, covariate shift uh, adaptation of the MRCs, we have that the, the convex optimization problem associated to these MRCs is defined as, as here, where this bar phi uh, of L is defined in terms of the losses, and we are uh, just going to consider uh, for this work 0, 1 and log losses. So this bar, uh, bar phi is defined as, as, as this, like for the 0, 1 loss, and with this expression for the, for the log loss. Just a few things to comment uh, from this slide. The first one is that this complex optimization problem might be solved uh, using common uh, techniques such that, for example, a stochastic gradient descent. The second thing to comment from this complex optimization problem is that if we have some testing instances available at training, at the learning part, we can estimate this expectation using that testing instances as this bar, bar fee function does not depend on the labels. And the second, uh, the third thing uh, to comment is that this commercial optimization problem is carrying out an L1 type regularization, so we can penalize each component of the variable mu separately, so that the components of mu that are poorly estimated will be strongly penalized. Well, So now, in the next slide, we have uh, this theorem. This theorem just, just gives us uh, how the classification rules for the, for the 0, 1 and the log loss are represented. We have the first one is the 0, 1 uh, loss, the one associated to 0, 1 loss. And the second one is the one related to log loss. And we have also uh, the minimax risk R of U that it's just the value of the minimum of the convex optimization problem. And just note from here that uh, this alpha function here represents, as I said previously, the confidence with which uh, we, we classify so that for very, very small values of alpha we end up having that our classification rule assigned 
uniformly assign labels in the set of labels. And also one more thing to comment from here is that we have the deterministic classifier defined as this so that even for the test instances that we don't have an alpha associated to them, we can classify them using this deterministic classifier as it doesn't depend on alpha just at the cost that we will not know the confidence of this classification. So, well, in this slide I will uh, discuss a bit, a bit, just give you the idea on in practice of the choice of the weight functions. As I said previously, in our approach we can consider every pair, any pair of, of functions alpha and beta that uh, satisfied uh, this condition, well, that it's also written here, the one that is inside the, the square. And well, we have that our approach is based on estimating the expectation that we can see at the beginning of the, of the slide. And we have that how can this expectation is estimated just depend on the higher value of the weight beta. So, we can uh, have more accurate estimation, estimations of the expectation by decreasing the higher beta value. But just uh, as we have that the values of alpha and the values of beta are related, if we decrease the values of beta, we are also decreasing the values of alpha. And just to remember from uh, previous slides, that for uh, small values of alpha, we have that our classification rule uniformly assign labels in the set of labels, meaning that it will have a relevant uh, confidence in a very small subregion of the of, of X. So here is where we have the trade-off. We have a trade-off a trade-off be between having better expectations estimates and having classification rules that are uh, confidence in uh, large uh, regions. So, well, uh, we also have some generalization bounds regarding the, the MRCs. Here we have the first inequality, it's, it's, defi it's defining the, that the risk can be bounded using the minimax risk, that, rem that remember that was the, the value at the minimum of the convex optimization problem, plus uh, this quantity, and we have that if lambda is higher than than the difference between tau and the expectation of phi sub alpha, we have that the minimax risk is an upper bound of the risk. And the second inequality just uh, is given that the risk can be bounded by the smallest minimax risk that we have defined uh, here, plus a quantity that decreases with the number of training samples. So we here we can see a bit of the idea of how are we going uh, to choose in practice which is the best uh, alpha and beta uh, functions. We are, as we have, that the minimax risk is the one, it's an upper bound of the risk. So we are going in practice to select uh, weights alpha and beta that give us the lower minimax risk. So, well, now that I have explained a bit our approach, and I have also explained uh, the learning framework in, in which we are going to use our approach, I will explain in practice how can we compute these alpha and beta functions. Because, uh, well, in covariate shift we can do uh, two assumptions. The first assumption is that we know the true uh, probability distributions that it, uh, I mean, in practice, we, we cannot know the, the distribution of, of the data. We cannot have the the real distribution of the data. So the second assumption that it's the one that we are going to use is that we have, uh, during the learning part, we have some training uh, and testing uh, samples available. We have instances, uh, well, some training samples and some testing instances. So to compute uh, in practice these, these weights, we are going to solve this complex optimization problem. This convex optimization co uh, problem here, it's called double weighting kernel mean matching, and it's just a generalization of the, of the usual uh, kernel mean matching uh, problem for the covariate shift adaptation. And basically what we are doing here is we want to minimize the difference uh, 
uh, between a sample average in of of kernels waiting by this the, this first part corresponding corresponds to the test uh, instances and the second part corresponds to the training instances and this is inside a reproducing kernel Hilbert space and well uh, just one thing to note from here is that this hyperparameter d is the one that controls uh, the values of of alpha so that if we fix d equal one we are fixing all the values alpha equal one and this is the conventional kernel min matching and if we give higher value to to this d we are allowing a uh, value alpha to uh, have a different value so this value d in practice is the one that will control the trade-off so uh, in practice we will select the value d that uh, give us the smallest minimax uh, risk as i as i said and well uh, just another theorem regarding this double weighting kernel min matching that it's uh, well the one that it's given here describing a uh, uh, bound in terms of of the of this average of kernels and just note from here that the conventional kernel min matching uh, have this other uh, bound so uh, using the proposed approach the double weighting kernel min matching we have d times larger effective uh, sample size so well uh, from here just just comment uh, that so well uh, to conclude uh, this talk uh, i will present uh, some experiments that uh, we have uh, done for this uh, covariate chip uh, adaptation the first one it's uh, using synthetic, synth uh, synthetic data in this experiment what we wanted to see is how the, the different methods the weighted uh, the robust and the proposed method that it's called uh, DW of double weight in general covariate C, GCS, uh, behave when uh, we have different training and testing uh, support, uh, supports. Uh, this moving from the weighted uh, favorable, favorable uh, situation to the robust favorable situation is controlled by the parameter D. So for uh, values of delta, sorry, not D. So for values of delta that are close to uh, zero, we have that the training distribution contains the testing distribution so this will be challenging for the robust approach and this will be a favorable situation for the weighted approach and for values of delta close to 0 0.5 we will have uh, the other the other thing we have that this situation is favorable for the robust distribution and challenging for the weighted distribution as the training support it's contained inside the testing one and here we can see how our proposed uh, method that it's the purple one can adapt to general covariate shift uh, situations while the other are challenging in in some situation are challenged in, in some situations well uh, we also have developed uh, some covid 19 uh, experiments uh, in these experiments as we don't have data from different regions or different hospitals we are uh, generating let's say the covariate shift came from the part that data came from different periods of time so for these experiments we are fixing the training uh, set or, uh, from uh, data that come from a specific dates and we are going to select different testing uh, data from different uh, periods of time so for the times partition that are uh, larger for the last time partitions the data is more separate in in time so again we can see how our approach this time again it's the purple one but here we we have had other uh, popular approaches uh, we can see how our approach can adapt to general covariate scenarios and we have a third uh, set of of experiments in this case uh, the first four data sets that appear in the table uh, were uh, normal data sets using used for supervised learning for supervised classification and in these data sets we have introduced the covariate shift, shift artificially based on the median of the first three futures of the data set 
one of the median of the pr first principal component. And we have this last training news group dataset that is intrinsically affected by, by covariate shift as the data again ca come from uh, different times. So again, we see how our proposed approach can adapt to general covariate shift scenarios. So, well, just to conclude the presentation, first we have seen uh, the existing approaches and we have seen that these approaches might be challenged in some situations. We have that they might be challenged when we don't have the support uh, conditions satisfied and also when some of the values of beta and alpha ratios take disproportionately large values. We have seen our proposed approach based on weighting both training and test samples at the same time, avoiding existing methods problem, and we have seen a, a learning framework for this uh, covariate shift adaptation based on minimax risk classifiers. We have also seen the third thing, how to compute in practice these uh, weights using a generalization of the conventional carrying matching method together with some generalization bounds that, that show how can we uh, increase the effective sample size and we have also seen uh, some experiments or, and scenarios in which we see how our, how our approach by uh, adapt better to general covariate scenarios. So, well, these are uh, the references of some of the main papers. The first one is the one that uh, we have uh, just published. The second one is the one regarding the MRCs. The third one is the one regarding uh, kernel mean matching. And the last one is the one regarding uh, the robust approach. And well, uh, that's all. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for coming. And well, if you have any questions, I don't know if you, maybe you can put it in the chat and so and and I can answer them. So well, thank you. So I don't know if now we should check. Ah, okay. The robust approach. And well, that's all. Should we tell the last that we have finished? I kind of. And well, if you have any questions, I don't know if you can put it. Okay. So, uh, well, it seems that, okay, so we, I think we didn't have any technical problem during the talk. I, I hope so. And what? Well, no, ¿Sí? no, 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 so yeah, well, I think maybe we should wait a bit uh, until... Okay. So... See, well, maybe you tell us that they have finished talk. Right, the chat is still in the question. Ah, yeah. I have to see in... Yeah, it's good to have it, no? I would say. It is not clear to me the scenario you are considering. Uh, well, uh, okay. I I hope you are you are hearing. Uh, well, so the scenario we are considering is we have, as I said, training uh, in, well training samples available at the learning part. This is common for all supervised uh, learning approaches. And we have also considered that we have uh, some testing instances also available at training. We don't need, like, these testing instances don't need to be the ones that are uh, the ones in, we are, in which we are going to classify. But the thing here is that the training and the testing uh, distributions are different. And if we want to correct this difference in order to have better classification rules, we need to know a bit of the testing distribution. I mean, about the test, the training distribution is much more simple because as we have a uh, training data, uh, we can, if we want, estimate the, 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 training, the training distribution, but for the testing one, 
we need to assume that we have some testing instances. I mean, we don't need to assume how many we have, or even we don't need to, we don't really need to have the testing instances that are the one corresponding to the ones we are going to classify, but we need to have a bit of information of the of how is the testing distribution. I mean, the more uh, testing instances we have, the better uh, the, the classification rule uh, will be, but we are not assuming, in general for the experiments, we are considering uh, like the same uh, number of te testing instances as training samples, but uh, we don't need to assume to have a specific number of testing instances. And also the point that these testing instances don't need to be the ones that we are going to classify, just have to belong to the test distribution. So, well, I don't know if with that I am answering your question, but... But yeah, I mean, in the generalization bounds, well, in the one that I put it here, uh, in this one, we have this term that uh, depends on the number of test, uh, uh, testing instances, so that, yeah, so this upper bound, uh, this bound will be uh, lower if we have more test instances, but yeah, I mean, we don't need to say a specific uh, number of, of them. I don't know if I am explaining myself or or not. Okay. So well, I don't know if. I don't know why, but I cannot write on the oh, me, me. I cannot write on the chat. I think it's because of my uh, 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 Gmail account. If you can write that, if anyone have any other question, I will go back to. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, this is the last slide. Uh, do you have any other questions? Ah, well, it's the thing you have. Sorry. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know how much time should we wait. Let's let's wait just a couple of minutes until someone writes, and if not, maybe we can close the. Okay, I think there will not be any. Yeah. yeah, so well, so well. Thank you very much uh, for for coming to to this talk, and I hope it will it was understandable, let's say, and also interesting for for all of, all of you. So yeah, uh, well, thank you very much. I think we can finish the. Ah, yeah, they say no questions from Donosti, so... Can you write thank you from 